Now we want to look at what happens when we have electrolytic cells. These are non-spontaneous reactions. We're looking at electrolysis. We have to provide electrical current to drive the reaction. So instead of lighting a light bulb, we're having to put a battery, a, some kind of energy source up to this cell so that it drives the reaction to happen. So when we recharge our batteries, we're doing an electrochemical or electrolytic reaction because the discharge of the batteries using them in our device was a spontaneous process. So the reverse process must be non-spontaneous. We're having to put in a source of energy to get that reaction to go. So when we look at an electrolytic versus a voltaic cell or a spontaneous reaction, there's really not that much difference in the actual setup. We still see that electrons are flowing from the anode to the cathode. In our electrolytic cell, that's the same thing, anode to the cathode. We still see oxidation happening at the anode, reduction happening at the cathode and oxidation at the anode, reduction at the cathode. For both of them, nothing changes as far as that part. What's different is when we look at our setup for our actual um, uh, voltmeter or our voltage source. So when we look at a spontaneous process, what we're doing here is we're simply measuring the potential difference. Here we're having to supply that potential difference in order to get that reaction to happen. And so we see that the, everything is the opposite as far as which reaction is happening in which version. So voltaic cells are spontaneous, electrolytic cells are non-spontaneous. So other than recharging batteries, why would we ever want to do this? Well, what we can look at is if we want to electroplate something, we want to coat a metal surface on a solution. If we take our anode, for example, it's copper. We've got a copper solution here. This dashed line represents a membrane that actually functions as the salt bridge to help kind of balance things out. When we look at here, our spoon is acting as our um, cathode where reduction is going to occur. We put a voltage source in. We have electrons flowing from the anode to the cathode. And as these copper ions come out of solution, they're actually going to plate onto that spoon, onto that cathode. And so as a result, we're going to get this layer of copper onto the surface. Now, we don't see too many copper-coated spoons, but we can do this with things like silver. And anytime we want to get a nice thin layer of a metal over that surface, we can do this by providing some source of potential. Now we're going to look at two different scenarios. We're going to talk about when we have aqueous solutions and then we're going to talk about what happens when we're looking at a molten salt. Because remember, a molten salt separates into its ions. It's still a strong electrolyte as a molten salt. But now what we can look at is we can put electricity in this. We can put a voltage source in here and we can get this electrolysis of the salt to happen. And so we can actually get our, um, our reaction, our sodium ions to go into form solid sodium and we can get our chloride ions to form chloride. Oops, that should not have a minus charge there. Get our chloride ions going to chloride gas so we can actually reverse the process of making that sodium chloride salt in the reverse. We do have to provide voltage. This is a non-spontaneous process. We're putting energy in to get these melted to get them into the liquid phase. Notice that we're not dealing with aqueous phase substances here. There's no water involved. We still, in this case, we're going to have two inert electrodes here for both sides. A lot of times it's platinum, really doesn't matter because they're not involved in the reactions. We still have electrons flowing from the anode to the cathode. The reaction happening at the anode is still the oxidation, and it's always going to be the anion that is oxidized and the cation is, that is reduced. We're not going to see something like sodium ion going to sodium 2 plus. That is simply not going to happen. And so it's always going to be the cation that is reduced to the, the neutral atom and the anion which is oxidized to the neutral atom. So on the previous example, we were only worried about having one molten salt. Well, what happens when we have multiple molten salts? So we have multiple cations or anions. We have to figure out which one is actually going to be oxidized and which one's going to be reduced. Now we know it's going to be the cation that's going to be reduced because we know the cation is going to go to the neutral atom and it's going to be the one with the more positive reduction potential and things got a little bit out of line here when I transferred over to the iPad and so this is our species that is reduced and then our species that is oxidized is the more negative 
oc reduction potential. Now note that these values are actually for aqueous solutions. Okay, we're looking at aqueous solutions going to solid, and what we're actually worried about is silver ion in the liquid form going to the solid. And while the numerical values will be different, the mag the uh, the magnitudes of them will be different. The relative values are the same, that if the aqueous ion has a more positive reduction potential, then the liquid ion is going to have a more positive reduction potential. So we can use the values for the trends. We just don't know the actual cell potential for these um, these molten salts. So if we have a mixture, say we have our silver and copper cations, we have fluorine and chlorine anions, what we look at is we look at them for the aqueous solutions, we look at the reduction potentials for the aqueous solutions, and the more positive reduction potential will be the species that is reduced. So we're going to see that silver is going to be our reduction process, the silver ion going to silver rather than copper. And then we look for the anion with the more negative reduction potential to be oxidized first. And so we say, well, chlorine has the more negative reduction potential. It's still not negative, but it's definitely more negative than the fluorine, which is at 2.87 volts. And so that's going to be our oxidation reaction that's happening. Again, these values are for aqueous solution, and we're dealing with liquid ions from the molten salts, but the trend, the order that they're in remains the same even if the actual magnitude or the value of those potentials is different. The other thing we have to worry about with electrolysis is we look at electrolysis, we have non-spontaneous reactions, we're putting in a voltage source to get those electron, those reactions to happen. We looked at what happens when we dealt, dealt with electrolysis of molten salts where there was no aqueous solution that we could figure out what's oxidized, what's reduced. Now what we have to deal with is electrolysis and aqueous solution because things get a little bit more complicated. Because when we look at just water, we don't see, it doesn't have any charge carrier, we're not going to get electrolysis to happen. However, when we have a salt. Now we have a charge carrier. Now electrolysis can occur. And now water is basically in competition with that electrolysis process, with the oxidation and reduction. And what we actually have to look at is look at the reduction potentials for both the oxidation and reduction of water and see how those compare to the oxidation and reduction for the ions that are in that solution. So just like when we looked at the electrolysis of the mixture of molten salts and we had to worry about the one that was more positive or more negative, we're going to have to do the same thing with water and whatever ions are present. We have to worry about is water going to reduce preferentially over the other species or is it going to oxidize preferentially over the other species. One thing that is important to note here is that these cell potentials given for these two reactions, that these cell potentials given for these two reactions are under the non-standard conditions, are when H plus and OH minus are equal to 1 times 10 to the minus 7, which is how they exist under neutral solutions. So these are not under standard conditions, but this is how it actually exists. So these are the values we're going to use to compare it to the cation or anion when we're trying to figure out which one's going to be preferentially reduced or oxidized. So let's look at an example of how we have to worry about this. When we look at our um, water and our iodine here, we're looking at the anion, so we're basically looking to see which one is going to be oxidized. What we have to look at is to look at this reaction and say, what is going to be the more negative reduction potential? That's going to be the species that is oxidized. And in this case, the iodine is the more negative reduction potential. There, how, there may be cases where it's the more positive reduction potential, and or that water is the more negative reduction potential, and therefore will be the reaction that actually happens at the anode. Now we look at the other reaction here. We're looking at our sodium ion and seeing what's going to be reduced, the cation or the water. Here I see that the more positive reduction potential, still negative values, but the more positive reduction potential is the water. So in this case, it's actually the water that's going to be reduced and not the sodium ion, which will remain unreacted in that solution. So the more positive reduction potential is the species that is reduced.